My name is Carol McCoy. I am interviewing John C. McLemore today on August 28, 2019 in Nashville, Tennessee at the Nashville Bar Association headquarters at 150 4th Avenue North, Suite 1050. The time is approximately 2.15. Welcome, John. Thank you. Um, as a preliminary matter, I'd like to start off by asking you about where you were born, when you were born, and a little bit about your family. I was born on October 20, 1948. That is the same day that MacArthur returned to Corregidor, except it had happened four years earlier. I saw that on a calendar when I was in the third grade, and I've remembered it ever since. I was born in Vanderbilt Hospital, and I was a breech birth. Uh, I came out feet first and on the way out apparently swallowed a lot of bad stuff, amniotic fluid, whatever, and that resulted in pneumonia. And I was very, very ill. Um, my physician was one of the great uh, uh, pediatricians of early, well, of the middle 20th century, Dr. Overall. I think he was James Overall, but he might have been John Overall. And he practiced with Dr. Strayhorn. And he told my parents that I was going to die and that he had some medicine that he could, that he could give me that would either kill me or it might save me. It was one of the mycin drugs. And so my parents said, give it a shot. And pardon the pun, they did. <laughs> and I lived. And as a result of that, I was a miracle baby and then I was a miracle child. It's not very good to be either one of them, I don't think, but uh, I made it. Now, I have parents. My mother was Margaret Lyne, L-Y-N-E, Macklemore, and my father was Claiborne Tolliver Macklemore, Jr. Uh, my father had come to Nashville during the Depression, having graduated from the 11th grade. There was no 12th grade in Statesboro, Georgia. But he came here to work in the family business, Omen Construction Company. My mother grew up on Highland Avenue. There's probably 100 yards of Highland Avenue still remaining on the Vanderbilt campus. Um, but the houses are long since gone. and. She had two sisters and a brother, and my, my grandmother uh, lived with my Aunt Lois and my Aunt Ruth, and they were very instrumental in my bringing up. Uh, I went to their house every Friday and spent the night with them, and that was a, that was a big deal, and my sister did that after. She was born three years later. And your sister's name is? Jane Howell, Jane McLemore Howell. And she is the wife of the undertaker in Chapel Hill, Tennessee, at the, at the Lawrence Funeral Home. And today, you have your own family. Yes. I am married to Carolyn Crude McLemore. Carolyn Melinda with an A, M-A-L-I-N-D-A. -A. Uh, and I met her when I was in college. She grew up in Victoria, Virginia. And of course, I grew up in Nashville, so we didn't have any opportunity to meet until we were in college. She went to Longwood College. I went to the Virginia Military Institute. And we met at a Christmas party at Longwood College Baptist Student Union. I walked into the door of the Baptist Student Union and saw her. She was the hostess for the night. And I said to myself, there is the girl I'm going to marry. And that's just a story, except for one thing. I went back to the Institute that night, riding the bus, cost $5 to ride the bus over the mountain from Lexington to Farmville, Virginia, and then the same $5 got me back home. And I went back 
to at the Institute that night wrote a letter home and said, tonight I met the girl I'm going to marry. And we have that letter. Uh, it has survived. So it's not just a tale. It really did happen. And during your marriage, what did she do? She was a teacher. Uh, and she taught special ed students at the Benton Hall School. Now, she was one of the first teachers at Franklin Road Academy, but then she got pregnant with our first child, which could lead us into our children. The, uh, our first child was William Tolliver McLemore, known in the family as William Tolliver McLemore the Magnificent. Um, and he is an auctioneer and... For? No, an auctioneer for? For McLemore Auction Company, yes. And How old is he? When was uh, he born? He was born in, he was a bicentennial baby. He was born in 1976. And it looks as though he went to a very fine college. Well, he went, he went to the Grassland schools and public schools in Williamson County until they threw him out. Um, he w was a little more rambunctious than they needed, and he went from there to, to um, uh, the university school, and he entered the university school in the eighth grade, not a time when you normally enter one of the schools like that, but that's where he went, and he got a magnificent education there. My wife and I both think that he had a better education when he left the university school than either of us had when we left college. And he went there from there to Yale. He had decided he was going to go to Yale when he was five years old, and he never changed. And he would only make application to one school, and that was Yale. And it drove the guidance counselors at the university school absolutely mad. He told them if he didn't get in Yale, he would go to the auto diesel college. And he, we never had to test him on that. He got accepted. And you have a daughter? We have two. We have Margaret Melinda McLemore, M-A-L-I-N-D-A, and she went to the Williamson County Public Schools and on to the University of Richmond, and she is married to Jeff, and her last name is now Eastman. So she married, she married into the Eastman family, but not George Eastman. He never married, he never had any children, and he committed suicide. Um, but that doesn't mean that we were not led to believe that she was marrying into the Eastman Kodak family. And they played a real game with the family for several months, uh, making us think that Meg was marrying into the family and that we, they would be living part-time in the Eastman house, which of course is a museum, but it's a huge house in Rochester, New York. It turned out not to be true. And she is coincidentally doing what as a career? Uh, she is a professional photographer. With the last name of Eastman. With the last name of Eastman and with a son named Ansel. She has, they have three children, Elliot, Ansel, and Melinda, M-A-L-I-N-D-A, -A, who has renamed herself Lindy Lou. You have another daughter? Yes, we have Elizabeth Ann McLemore Kelsey. She went, she went on a family vacation to Montana when she was eight years old. On the way home, she told us and everyone on the airplane that Montana was the very best place in the world and that she was going to come back and go to college there and live the rest of her life in Montana. She never changed, just like her brother who never would go to any school but Yale. She would go to no, she would go nowhere but to Montana and she lives there now. She has a husband who is an artistic and functional welder. He works three weeks on, three weeks off on the North Slope in the oil fields, and he comes home and he creates things with his welding. He's quite an artist, but it's the oil field work that makes the money. 
Uh, they have three children, a set of twins, Sabrina and Scarlett, and then uh, Cora, who is the oldest child, and she is affectionately known as Cora the Cowgirl. And what really cool job does your daughter Liz have? <laughs> Our daughter Liz takes care of the medical students who come from the University of Washington to Missoula so that they can remember their roots and so that they can uh, remember to come back and repay the, the state of Montana for helping them go through medical school. So when the students at the University of Washington go out to the hospitals, they fly these kids out to cities in Montana and Elizabeth is the den mother for those kids and she tells them where to get their hair cut, tells them where to buy their food, makes sure that they have uh, apartments to live in and the microwave oven works, things like that. And she's, she takes care of the medical students. Now have you told me about all of your grandchildren? Uh, I've told you uh, except, about, except about Will's children, Eli, E-L-Y, uh, and Agnes, uh, and they, they live in Nashville, of course, and they, they're just ordinary children that do extraordinary things. Let's talk about your ordinary education, mostly primary, secondary, and higher education. Where did you go to school? Well, I did not go to kindergarten. Uh, there was no public kindergarten when I started school in 1954. Uh, and so I, I didn't go. I went to the first grade in 1954, and that was to Glendale School. Now, Glendale School is still there. I understand it is a, it's designated as a Spanish-speaking school where lots of children go, not just people who have English as a second language, but children go there and they speak Spanish there. That's what I've heard. Uh, and, but the thing about Glendale School when I went there was it was brand new. It was in the old Glendale Park and luckily it was named Glendale School. I remember driving because the intention was to name it Edith Grimes School. All of our textbooks were stamped Edith Grimes School. And can you imagine what the kidding that the kids would have received if they went to Grimes School? Uh, but it was the only the only reason we knew that was because they'd already stamped the textbooks. The school was hideous, architecturally speaking, uh, and this goes back to certain corruption that Nashville had regarding the building of public buildings. And they had windows where if there had been a fire, every child would have died. There was no possible way to get out of them. Um, and it took a big stick to open the upper ones. And Mr. Scott, the janitor, who was a wonderful man, would come around and adjust the windows occasionally. Um, Before we get too far down um, into the history of elementary school, yeah. you did have an opportunity to go to a private kindergarten, Mrs. Cornett's? Yes, Mrs. Cornett's kindergarten. Ms. Cornett had taught John Glenn, and of course we didn't know who John Glenn was, nor did anybody else. I think she probably didn't pay much attention to it till she saw him on the te television when he made his space flights. Uh, but she had taught him. And so had I gone to Miss Cornett's kindergarten, uh, I probably would have, you know, there's no telling, been some sort of nuclear physicist or something. But uh, that just didn't happen that way. I wasn't interested in going to kindergarten and my parents left that decision to me, that was a bad one. Well, you did start Glendale in September of 1954. And how many students were in your class? There were 48 in our class. And we have a photograph of the class uh, that was taken much later in the year than the first day. And it's got 42 students in it. Uh, 
and my teacher was Ms. McNeil, and she stayed, and we, um, I had her as a sec in the second grade also. Uh, I did not get along with Ms. McNeil. She divided the class into uh, the, the really smart kids, uh, the red birds, and then the blue birds were the mediocre kids, and then the canaries were the troublemakers. Uh, one of the canaries would ultimately graduate from Vanderbilt summa cum laude, but he had to have two bowel movements a day, and so he wasn't worth fooling with in the first and second grade. It was a miserable, terrible place, and I, 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 I don't know that I could even walk in the door there uh, today. Did you spend all eight years at Glendale? No, six. Six years. Six, and during that time, I was a student in the fourth grade. I was in the first class of Peggy Batson, later to be Hobbs. She was one of the great legendary teachers of Nashville. She taught for many years in the Metro system, retired, and then went to the Oak Hill School. And she died recently, um, and I was amazed when her brother, a hero of mine, Neil Batson, one of the great bankruptcy lawyers of the last half of the 20th century and part of the 21st, uh, an Atlanta lawyer, uh, called me and said she had specifically asked that I be one of her pallbearers. Uh, but if it had not been for Ms. Batson, I would probably been in a prison for the criminally insane. She was a wonderful influence on my life. She read to us every day after lunch. One book in particular she read was about Herbert, and Herbert got in trouble all the time, and his Uncle Horace would always come to the rescue and I wished for an Uncle Horace, never have had one. Uh, I get in trouble and have to get out myself. But she, she introduced us to so many wonderful authors and uh, so many wonderful books. What happened in the end of the sixth grade? I went to John Overton High School uh, and it was, it was a brand new school uh, I think I was in the fourth graduating class, uh, and we were in the sixth, sixth through the twelfth grade, and there was no apparent interest there in teaching anything. Uh, it was simply, you must be quiet, you must go from class to class, orderly, uh, and it, it, it was a place that I look upon uh, as being an extension of the Glendale School, which was no fun at all. Do you remember any of your classmates? Oh gosh, yes. We had, we had. I had wonderful classmates who were struggling with the same, with the same oppressive atmosphere that I was. I played on a junior high football team, and we ran an unbalanced line to the right, and David Graham Orr, who would later become a very high executive at the CSX system was the center. I was the pulling guard. Dick Lodge was the regular guard. Is that the Nashville lawyer, Dick Lodge? That's the Nashville lawyer, Dick Lodge, lobbyist and just generally wonderful person. Uh, and then next to him was Chad Hollahead Holliday. We called him Hollahead. He would go on to be chairman of the board and chief executive officer of DuPont Nemours Corporation. And then there was a fellow named Larry Benaza, and I've since run into Larry Benaza a couple of times in my career. Larry can run anybody's finance company. He, he has been, uh, I don't know if he's ever been a bank manager, but he's certainly been a finance company manager, and, and uh, it's just a good guy. And he was a fine athlete, unlike the rest of us. <laughs> Did you play any other sports? No, just football. Did you have any other interests or activities at that time? I shot on the rifle team. I guess that is a sport. 
and uh, I shot on the rifle team, and and Youth Incorporated sponsored that, and that was that was a, we had a the assistant principal at Overton. His name was Lucian Battle, had us to his farm once a month to shoot any kind of gun you wanted to bring to shoot on his rifle range. And we often would bring our guns to school to show Mr. Battle. And it's such a, con you know, it's such a conflict with what the situation would be today if you walked, out, walked into a school carrying a Winchester 3030 lever action rifle <laughs> with bullets in your pocket <laughs> so that you could talk to Mr. Battle about how to set the sights correctly. What were and, your favorite classes? Uh, it, it, it was just not a, a good experience. There was nothing that I really cared for. Now, I, I liked English, and I had a teacher there named Paula Carroll, who was magnificent. She was a freshman teacher. She had taught Indians out west, and she could write on the board, on the blackboard, with, and look straight at the class. And it was extraordinary. And finally, Bob Cherry, who was in the class, Bob Cherry would go on to, to be the person who told um, uh, the, the movie actor, uh, Sergeant, uh, oh, phooey. I'm sorry, I'm having a lapse. But at, at any rate, Bob is very, very creative and is an artist. And he said, Miss Carroll, where did you learn how to write on the board and look at us? And she said, Bob, that's very simple. On the Indian reservation, the first day I turned my back on the class to write on the board, a knife stuck up in the board. I turned around and started writing this way, and I've been doing it ever since. She loved the Indian children. She would talk to us about them. And it was probably one of my first introductions to prejudice. Uh, I didn't recognize that there was prejudice because we were not exposed to anybody to be prejudiced against uh, un until much later. Well, outside of school, did you have any hobbies? Were you involved in anything in the community? While you, did you have a little job in high school? No. Anything like that? No. I just came home every afternoon except when I was playing football. And don't ask me what I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when you I don't remember it if I did. All right. When you finished high school, where did you go? I went to the Virginia Military Institute, the Where's healthful and pleasant abode of a crowd of honorable youths, pressing up the hill of science with no emulation. Where is that? Lexington, Virginia. And how did you manage to get in? That's a really good question. <laughs> My father wanted me to go. My father wanted me to go to college so bad. I would. His first cousins had gone to Vanderbilt, and but as far as his line of his limb of the family tree, nobody had ever gone to college, and and so I was going to go to college or go to prison probably. You know, there was. About, had you, you know, been arrested sometime? No, no, oh, but but you could feel it. But it just what what else would you do but go to college? You were at Overton High School and. And that's what you were supposed to do. And it was, you know, it was, a, it was the same socioeconomic group as Hillsborough, Hillwood. Uh, Glidcliff was a brand new school at that time also. Uh, and so I was gonna go to college and my father was very anxious for me to go to college. And so my junior year, he began to put the pressure on, where are you gonna go to college? And, uh, I tried to explain to him that you didn't really make that decision until you were a senior. It didn't work. Uh, he, he marched to the beat of his own drum on this particular issue, and, and uh, so I told him I was going to go to the University of Georgia. He said, well, how do you get in the University of Georgia? And I said, well, you send off for a catalog, and you get, a, you get uh, an application. You fill out the application. You send it in. Do that, he said. Do that. Well, I knew better than not to do that, so I did it and didn't say anything about it. But ultimately, it came back to him that we were going to go to college, and again, how are we coming on the University of Georgia? And I told him that 
the University of Georgia had lied to me and that I was not interested. Now, this is just true. I mean, it's just how stupid a person can be. And I have, I have fallen to the depths of stupidity in my life, but I really thought that if the University of Georgia was doing their admission system one way, that every team in the Southeastern Conference would be doing it the same way too, even Vanderbilt. And they had sent a letter and it began, there will be 10,000 applications for the upcoming class, whatever year it was, I guess, not class of 1965, um, at the University of Ge um, Georgia. Well, I looked through the application and they wanted to know in 300 words or less why I wanted to come to the University of Georgia. And I uh, knew right then that nobody, I assumed that there would be one or two people in the admissions department that they just couldn't get 10,300 words or less read, and so they really were not telling me the truth. And so I explained that to my father, and he's, hmm. he said, well, where do you think you'll go now? And I said, well, I'm thinking, I'm, and I told him, I said, none of these party schools, none of these state, big state schools, I'm not going there. I think I should go to a place where there's a little bit more discipline. He said, go to West Point. Oh, I couldn't any more get in West Point than a man in the moon. I was dumb as a box of rocks. And although I was able to make it all right through Overton High School, I wouldn't have done very good at MBA, I assure you of that. So uh, I, I, he said, well, then why don't you go to VMI? Now, what does that stand for? The Virginia Military Institute, or Virginia's Marching Idiots. It's there any, there any, and how old a school is it? It was founded November 11th, 1839. And how did your father know about it? Because Omen Construction Company was building interstate highways at the time, and they had in built a portion of I-81, which goes within almost whistling distance of VMI. And he had landed in the company plane on an airstrip in Lexington. Washington and Lee is right next door, so he had seen both schools, but didn't make any point to tell me about Washington and Lee. Is there anything unusual about BMI? Uh, it's a military school. <laughs> and it's all boys. Oh, it was all boys, yes. But in Virginia at that time, the girls' schools were the girls' schools and the boys' schools were the boys' schools. I'm not, the University of Virginia may by that time have had women. Washington and Lee did not. I was a member of the class of 70, and I know they did not have women when I left. And you were aware of that when you applied? Oh, sure, yeah. But it had structure? It, oh, they had plenty of structure. And how did you greet that st structure when you got there? Uh, I walked into Jackson Arch and was greeted by a cadet, cadet captain named Hall. I believe his name was Mike Hall, but I may be wrong about that. He was the company commander of C Company, and he noticed through my sports shirt that I did, was not wearing a T-shirt. And he let into me about hygiene and what a stud muffin I must think that I, am, I was. I tried to explain to him, no, no, he was completely wrong about that. And there was no way to please that guy. No way in the face of the earth. He chewed me out about not having a t-shirt on. And my wife says to this day that, that I will wear a t-shirt with my pajamas because <laughs> I'm afraid that my call will come and get after me again. Uh, I endured like everyone else that, that goes through the initiation process at VMI. So you chose it because your father suggested it. I chose it because my father suggested it, and I chose it because I could get in. Because and Mr. Sturton Oman Sr. had a very close friend who was a rabid VMI alumnus uh, and recruiter, and he invited him to Nashville to meet me. And it was during 
it was during the Christmas break of 1965 and I went over to my father's office because I was summoned there wearing my Rebel Bowl blazer. Now, don't get any idea that I really played high school football. I practiced a lot of high school football, but <laughs> I didn't play very much. I wasn't a very good athlete. Uh, but I had a Rebel Bowl blazer, and I thought that'd be a good thing to wear. And a black and red striped tie, that was the Overton colors. And I went over, and Claudine Ford, the receptionist, told me that there was a man back in Mr. Oman's office that I needed to meet and that I was to go straight back. And I did. And I stuck my head in the door and I said, I saw Mr. Oman sitting at his desk and right next to him in a straight back chair was another older man. And his name was Burris. I don't remember his first name. And he looked at me and he said, you boy won't go to hell hole. And I would later learn that he had lost his hearing in World War II in the artillery. He had a serious case of artillery or man's ear, so much so that he talked as if he had never been able to hear. And uh, he was extremely wealthy, and that made up for a lot, I guess, but <laughs> he. I said, pardon me? You more go hell hole, VMI. And I said, VMI? Yes, sir, I want to go to VMI. You come over here and talk to me. And he pulled another straight back chair. So there were three of us, like monkeys, in a straight row. And he liked horses. And so I talked to him about horses. I had had some experience in the summer. Uh, working with horses and we talked and he about 30 minutes later he said I see you in the fall I'll see you in VMI and I said yes sir when I got back to Overton there was a card in the mail Noni Johnson was the was the guidance counselor and she came into the she came into the lunchroom with this card and she said John McLemore John McLemore and somebody says no he wants to talk to you and I looked at you yes Ms. Johnson you know and she said you've been accepted early admission at VMI I've not made application that's pretty early yeah <laughs> and and she said she didn't wasn't unaware that I'd ever made admission and I said I I said, Miss Johnson, I don't tell you everything I do. <laughs> and, and she was very proud. I'd been accepted at a Virginia school. Little did I know that I was going to find out that the students at the Virginia schools who had had Virginia public education were about a year and a half ahead of Tennessee students. <laughs> now, when you graduated from high school, what honors or awards did you receive? Nothing. All right, so then you head into VMI. Yes. And what happened that first year? That's a, that's a, nobody has ever really happened. I'll tell you what, has ever asked me that question. You know, what happened? This, the initiation of VMI is extraordinarily hard. And it, it, is, it is amazing that you go through it. When it ended, and they said, tonight you will form in old barracks courtyard. And they gave us the uniform and they told us that when we had climbed to the fourth floor, the fourth stoop, meaning the porch outside your, your dorm room or barracks room, when you had reached the fourth stoop, you would be out of the rat line the initiation would have ended. And we had to do these cheers, the cheers for the sophomores, the third class, cheer for the second class, or the juniors, and then this cheer for the first class. And when we finished the cheer for the first class, the seniors, we broke 
and began running up the stairwells in old barracks to get to the fourth stoop. And it was a battle with the other three classes. And I turned the corner. What do you mean it was a battle? They, they, they were, were trying there. to keep you from going yes, up? Yes, they were there. And as I turned the corner, having gone from the first stoop to the second stoop and got in the stairwell from the second stoop to the third stoop, someone took a rolling garbage can, like a, the size pretty much of a 55-gallon drum. It was about halfway full of liquid. What it was, nobody will ever know, but I'm sure urine was part of it. And they threw it down that stairwell. They rolled it down the stairs? Yeah, well, they, wasn't doing it, they threw it down. And I was so pumped that I grabbed it and I carried it to the third stoop. And when I got up there, I took it and slung it at anyone who was standing in the sally port up there and got a bunch of them. Which are upperclassmen. Were upperclassmen, one of whom grabbed me by the neck. And I was running as hard as I could to get to the stairwell from the third stoop to the fourth stoop. And he was holding on. He was going to kill me, I think. Uh, it was, this was brutal. And, and it's, it, it's not a nice thing to have to go through. The, remember, like this it. was after seven years. I mean, seven months. Seven months of initiation. And so I had been eating square meals, walking in the rat line, squaring corners. What's Do, the rat line? The rat line is what the initiation process is called. Every freshman at VMI is a rat. And your fellow classmates are your brother rats. And thus the name of the movie, Brother Rat. And so I'm going from the third to the fourth stoop. This guy is holding on to my throat or my, my field jacket and the, at the neck. And there was no getting him off. When my brother rat, John Snake Hill, John Snake Hill was from Texas, and he had gone to Europe during the summer before coming to BMI and had gotten a tattoo of a snake on his hip, and thus the name Snake Hill. Um, and Snake Hill was coming up behind me, and he didn't know what peril I was in, but he was very anxious to get up to the fourth stoop and have this all be over with. And he stepped right in the middle of the back of that guy and probably grabbed him by the collar or the shirt himself. Maybe. And I don't know what he did because I couldn't see he was behind me, but I know he knocked that guy off of me. And I got to the top. And when I got to the top, I got to the answer to your question. And that is, I walked over through the sally port, the connector between new barracks and old barracks. And I went to the railing and I looked down into the courtyard of new barracks. And I said to myself, if anyone ever asks you if you would do it again, you tell them, hell no, I've done it once. And from that point on, VMI was my best friend. It's, it is an experience like none other. And I tell my children and I tell my wife, there are days when I don't think of you. You'll go off to camp or something like that and I'll go 24 hours. And I, I won't have a thought about you, but never. Is there a day I do not think about the Institute? It is my home. If, if something were to happen to my family and I had to go and sort it out, if they were killed or something like that, 
I know where I would go. I would go back to Lexington. I would go and sit on the bench along Le on a bench along Ledger Avenue, and I could sort out my problems there because that is home. Did Snake Hill make it to the fourth floor? Uh, he made it to the fourth stoop. He actually graduated. Uh, <laughs> Didn't you graduate? Oh, I did. I did graduate. What was your major? English. Did you have any memorable, you actually had a very memorable experience, but did you have any memorable teachers? Yes. Uh, major William Badgett was, he taught fine arts, art history, uh, and he, he saw something in me that nobody else saw. And he saw that I could tell a story. And he was, he was a real encourager. I, when I go back to Lexington, I go back to Major Badgett's, he's now Colonel Badgett, and he's taught at the Institute for more than 50 years. Uh, but I go to his home and I knock on the door, and he still remembers me. It's like going back to see Mr. Chips. Uh, while you were at VMI, how would you describe your study habits and your friends? Well, friends, the best friends in the world. Uh, study habits, uh, not very much. I, I had to survive there. And I came away from VMI with a passion to learn, but I had not had a great deal of time to, I was catching up the whole time I was there. And uh, I, I was not a good student. I was not a good student. I graduated. That's, that's all you can say about me academically. But I learned something. I, well, I learned several things, but I learned something about myself at VMI. When I was a rat, I looked around to see what it was that I wanted to do. What did I want to accomplish while I was there? I did it by accident. I didn't do it because I'd read it in a book or anything like that. I just did it. And I looked around to see what I might possibly do. And I said, I could be editor of the school newspaper. I thought that was something I could, have, could accomplish. And I came very close to meeting my goal. And, but another student was made editor, and I was made managing editor. He had sort of a nervous breakdown. That, that happens when you get under in, in immense pressure. And there's immense pressure at VMI. Uh, and, he lost his job as the editor of the newspaper and I was elevated. But I never felt that I was the editor in chief, so I never put myself on the masthead of the paper as editor in chief. I just took him off and I just rem remained the managing editor. But I finished the year out as the editor of the newspaper and I realized while I was doing that that I had no plan whatsoever for what I wanted to do when I achieved this goal. And that's one of the biggest things I learned at BMI. Don't take a task until you know what it is you want to accomplish. Don't try to figure it out while you're doing it. Know what you want to accomplish, and that needs to be part of your goal. Now, I learned three other things at BMI that are very important. Number one, I learned to be on time. I can be on time to anything. I learned to dress for the occasion and not complain about it. If my wife tells me we're going somewhere and I'm supposed to wear white tie and tails, I go rent white tie and tails, I wear them. It's the, it's, it's the uniform of the day. I have no problem with that and it's a very valuable lesson. And I learned don't ever, ever, ever build anything with stucco. When, when, I, when I walked into Jackson Arch and was greeted by Mike Hall, I believe I glimpsed a painter on the barracks 
painting the stucco. And although it is impossible because I graduated on a Sunday and buildings and grounds did not work on a Sunday, I have this vivid image that when I walked across the platform in front of the John Thomas Lewis Preston Library, I saw those painters sitting on the facade of the library watching the graduation with their rollers ready to start just as soon as we finished the ceremony. It's impossible it was a Sunday they wouldn't have been there, but I can see them clearly today. They painted at VMI every single day that it didn't pour down rain or it's blizzard snow. It, don't ever build something with stucco. Now, did you work at all while you were in college? I worked in the, in the, I worked in the George Catlett Marshall Research Library. And there I learned something else. When you pronounce Lejeune, as in Camp Lejeune in the Marine Corps, of which I was not a member, by the way. I don't want anyone to think that I was. You are mispronouncing it. It is Lejeune. And I know that because I called Major Lejeune, Major Lejeune, one time. And she, the daughter of John Archer Lejeune, uh, set me straight. And I wasn't a rat either. I was like a, I was like a second classman. She chewed me out one end to the other, telling me that I needed to learn who her commanding officer was. She was big muckety muck in the library, and a nice lady. Other than that particular incident, she disciplined me, and then we went on with our lives. And I worked very hard for Major Lejeune. And never. What did you do? What? What did you do? Shelved books. They, <laughs> I mean, they, they, the, the library had just been, just been finished and dedicated, so they were getting all kinds of interesting stuff, and it would get cataloged, and then they would, it would be originally uh, shelved, and I would, I did some original shelving there. Well, you graduated from VMI. I did. What honors and awards did you get when you graduated? Uh, nothing. Well, I, I did get an award for, um, it, it's a real nice silver bowl uh, for running the newspaper. Uh, it, was, it was an award for, publication, for my work in publications at VMI. And it was either given to the editor of the newspaper or the editor of the yearbook, and I beat the editor of the yearbook out for that. That's one of the few awards I ever got for anything in my life. <laughs> Very good. When you graduated, the Vietnam War was going on. Yes, it was. And did you go into the military? I did not. I had my orders. I had my uniforms and the whole nine yards. And one of the great untaken roads in my life is that I was rejected from the military because of a foot problem, which was a real foot problem, but a, but a curable foot problem. And I was just told, we don't want you. And that was the end of that. And I had to go find a job. And what did you do? Um, our next door neighbor back in Nashville uh, was Bob Battle, at, who was managing editor of the uh, of the Nashville Banner, and his wife Libby talked, my mother talked to Libby, and Libby talked to Bob, and Bob, I think, would regret it the rest of his life, but he gave me a job. And I went to work in May of 1970 at the now defunct Nashville Banner. And what did you do? I at Larry Brenton, who just died the other day, yeah. uh, took me in hand, walked me down Broadway to 8th and Broad, and walked me into the U.S. District Courthouse, which had no security at all at that time.
carried me around and introduced me to people in uh, various uh, organizations, the Corps of Engineers and uh, the Internal Revenue Service and, and of course, the courts. And, uh, and that was my introduction. I was told to cover, I was shown the press room and told to cover the federal court system and the federal government uh, like the Dew Covers Dixie, and that is what I did for about the next 13 or 14 months. You said the press room. Yes. What was the press room? The press room was a closet, but it was on the eighth floor across, immediately across the hall from one of the two courtrooms upstairs uh, on that floor. Were you the only person in the press room? I, I was. It was the Banners press room. Was and I had a teletype machine in there. Was there any other press room in there? Uh, the the um, Tennessean. The Tennessean had a press room, and it was on the other end of the building, of course. And Pat Welch was the the reporter who covered for the for the Tennessean. Uh, I I I did not get there in time for. To, to work opposite the, the legendary federal reporter who cover all the Hoffa trials, and I can't think of her name either right now, but, but maybe it'll come to me. Were you limited just to the federal courts? For the first 13 or 14 months, yes. And, and, any uh, memorable trials? Or? Oh, gosh, yes. There was were, there were, there were so much. First of all, William E. Miller was the chief judge. And he was, he supposedly had a heart condition, uh, and I think he probably did. And he stayed at home quite a bit and worked from home. He did not conduct co court very often. Uh, and so everything that happened while I was up there was before Judge Frank Gray, Jr. And we became very good friends. And he took me in tow and began to mentor me at last, finally, I had Uncle Horace for a while. Uh, of course, he was a yellow dog Democrat. I had no politics whatsoever. I, it, politics just weren't a big deal to me. And I got a 13 or 14 month course in why I had to be a Democrat. Uh, did but, it stick? Yeah, it okay. did. Uh, but, more than, but more than that, I got to, he, after, after he saw that I was gonna be there for a while, and after he saw I could tell a story, and I could write it, and not just write it, I could write it on a teletype machine. And let me tell you, that's hard. How did you learn? By, by calling the city desk and ask, what button do I need to punch next because I can't make this stupid machine do what it's supposed to. That's how you learn. And <laughs> Larry Brenton probably gave me a a quick course, but but let me tell you, you're typing on a type on a. It's not like an electric typewriter. It's not like anything else you work on. But once he saw that I was there, he brought he he took me in, and he told me the rules. And he said, if it is a jury trial, you sit on the front row. I want you as close to the witnesses as you can get. If it is a if it's just me on the bench, no jury. He did not call it a bench trial. I didn't hear that for years. I, I never heard the expression bench trial until many years after I'd left the newspaper. Uh, and I covered a lot of court uh, over that five, five years. Uh, but he said, you sit in the jury box in juror number one's seat. I want you to be as close to the witness as I am. I want to be able to read in the newspaper that you heard what I heard. And he said, if you want to talk with me and interview me about something, make an appointment with my secretary, Ms. Morford, and I will, I will take your questions in my chambers. You are welcome in my clerk's office and you can listen and use anything that you hear for background information, but you cannot quote anyone in the office and you cannot 
you can't use the material directly. He made it very clear. And I knew, having been at the Virginia Military Institute, that this man meant business and that he would cut my throat if some way or the other if I did not do what he said. And we had a wonderful relationship. His law clerk for that time when I was there was Bill William Lamar Newport, late of Harvard. And he was, <laughs> he was as leery of me as I was of him. Uh, but I would have, uh, in my newspaper career, have uh, experiences with a, a lot of Harvard people. But that's coming up. We're not there yet. All right. Before we get there, what memorable cases did you cover for the banner? I think the most memorable uh, in the federal court, well, there were two. One was the, was the, um, was the income tax evasion trial of Charlie Galbraith. It was tried by Joe Brown was the prosecutor. And uh, it, if I'm not mistaken, it was tried before a special judge who came down from Michigan. I don't think either of our judges would take that case. Uh, I don't see Judge Gray on the bench as I look back into uh, into the, the courtroom for that for that trial. But that was that was Cecil Brandstetter, Carol Kilgore. Uh, it was it, it was hard fought, and Galbraith won. Uh, the jurors by the end of the trial were disgusted with the conduct of the Internal Revenue Service. Charlie Galbraith, of course, was a character, and he made a lot of that uh, at the conclusion of the trial. But he, <laughs> amazingly Later. enough, he obeyed, he obeyed Carol, Kil Carol Kilgore and, and Cecil Brandstetter during the trial. He later became uh, an appellate judge on the Tennessee criminal courts, did he, he not? He certainly did. And there's another story about that, but we may pick it up later. Yeah. Uh, what was the other case? The other case was Miss Mary Farrell. Miss Mary Farrell was a voter registrar for Davidson County. And there was a young law student at Vanderbilt named Ashley Wiltshire. And uh, Ashley had gone down to register to, uh, to vote and had been rejected because he was a transient. He was a Vanderbilt student and therefore not a resident of Davidson County. And uh, this did not sit well with Ashley. And he began to look around to see if he could find someone uh, else who had had the same experience and what he found was he found many but he found in particular one doctor who was I believe he was head he was chief resident I think it was in pediatric oncology but I could be wrong about that his parent he had gone to Vanderbilt as an undergraduate and between his Freshman and sophomore years, his parents were killed in an automobile accident. And Vanderbilt, which has no reputation whatsoever for having a heart, just scooped him up and took care of him. And it was an amazing story to hear from the witness stand. Well, what did you do then? Well, I, I moved into such and such a dorm, and well, how did you make any money? I said, well, I had money, but I had to have a reason to be at Vanderbilt in the summer. So they had me cutting grass. Uh, they had me uh, umpiring baseball games in the youth league. They had me doing this and doing that. I was, you know, and they had jobs for me so that they could justify my living in the dorm all summer long. He went to Vanderbilt Medical School. He became a dorm daddy. That's what he called himself from the witness stand. He was some sort of advisor as a medical student. His, his internship was at Vanderbilt. His residency was at Vanderbilt. I'm sure that this doesn't happen to anybody ever again, but it happened to him. And he told of each year 
going on his father's birthday to register to vote and being turned down for something like 12 years by Mary Farrell because uh, he was a transient. And when his testimony in the motion, see, Ashley brought the lawsuit. There was a special agreement between Vanderbilt Law School and the U.S. District Court that students could try cases if they came with an advisor. Ashley came with some guy who never said a word. I'm sure he was legendary uh, Vanderbilt law professor. I just don't know what his name was. He sat there and let Ashley do his thing. And Ashley guided this physician through the story at the conclusion of which Judge Gray said, we'll take a break. And <laughs> I ran out of the courtroom. I went through the double doors out into the lobby. I turned the corner. I went down the long hallway and ran into Bill Newport's office, Bill Newport being the law clerk, and jumped onto the big green leather sofa and waited for Judge Gray to appear because I knew he was going to come to talk to Newport about the case. And I knew what the rules were. I wouldn't be able to put it in the newspaper, but I would find out what was going on. Gray appears at the door. I think he had to pee because he, he, had his, he had his robe on his shoulders like a cape. His arms weren't through the armholes. And he looks at Newport and he says, Newport, I just heard the goddamnedest testimony I believe I've ever heard in my life. And Newport's very casual. He looks up from his typewriter where he was typing some brief. He said, how's that, Your Honor? And he explains what he has just heard this physician tell about. And Bill very casually and very calmly says, do you remember when, do you remember when you called, you and Mrs. Gray called me and told me that you were going to hire me as your clerk and that you wanted to take Sarah and me out to dinner. And he says, yes, what does that have to do with anything? He says, that was the day we moved out of the married student housing at Vanderbilt. Sarah was packing that morning and I was not helping very much and she ran me out of the apartment, told me to go do something, and I thought, here's what I'll do. I will go register to vote. Bill had come from Memphis. He went down to register to vote and handed his Vanderbilt identification card, and he was refused. And, he, and Bill told Judge Gray that that happened to him on the day that he was moving out of Vanderbilt. And Judge Gray says, God damn! <laughs> and he swings around and when he does, the cape comes out like he's Dracula. And I say, this, this is just too good. I've got to write this someday, somewhere, and now I'm telling this story. Judge Gray is now dead, for those of you who are listening. And <laughs> he, he said, I'm going to fix this shit. <laughs> and, and, and he went back on the bench and granted a temporary restraining order to Ashley Wiltshire. The next time we were in court, the game was a little different. Ashley was there and I'm sure had worked himself to the bone to get ready for this big U U.S. District Court hearing on a permanent injunction. <laughs> Seated next to him. I don't know what happened to the faculty advisor. He was probably in the back of the courtroom by that time. It was George Barrett. And, and who, was, think, who was a preeminent attorney in Nashville for civil rights. Yes, that's right. And, and at the at defense table was Jack Norman Sr. Also an illustrious member of the Nashville Bar. And big Democrat. He and Gray had fought the wars 
in the in politics in Tennessee. Gray was was Jack Kennedy's campaign manager in Tennessee, and that's what got him the U.S. District Court appointment. And so, so Norman and Gray had been compatriots. And Norman gets up, and he was at, in the prime of his life. He, he was the great, flowing, white-haired giant of a man. And I remember sitting in the jury box and seeing his arms settle on each side of the, of the lectern. And I said, my goodness, this man could pick that lectern up and throw it in this jury box at me. He's that strong. And Gray had summoned him there. He had not paying any attention to Ashley Wilshire. It's Ashley's case, Ashley's motion. <laughs> but Gray said, told Norman to come. And, and, and he got up to the podium and he said, Your Honor, I believe there has been a grave mis... He got up that far. That's as far as he got. He never got the word misunderstanding out. And Gray looked down at him and said, Mr. Norman, if there is anything you can say to justify the conduct of this woman, then say it. If not, sit down. And, and Norman very calmly walks back to the council table and sits down in his chair and looks up at Gray and you can see in his eyes this Frank, you always could act the ass. <laughs> and, and, but it was short work for Miss Mary Farrell that day. George Barrett claimed the total victory. <laughs> Ashley Wilshire did not get to say one word that I recall. And, and, and went on to lead legal services. Lead, yes, lead legal services. He, he never stopped helping people after, after helping the doctor. And, and I hope that doctor gave him a ton of money <laughs> over the years. I hope he's wrote a regular check. But, okay, we want to stop here? John, we were discussing two memorable cases that you covered as a reporter for the National Banner when you worked there for 18 months or so. Well, I initially. worked there. I worked there for five years, but only the first 13 or 14 months was I at the U.S. District Courthouse. And what happened after that? I came in one morning and I was informed that I was not to go to the U.S. District Courthouse. I always reported to the Banner City Room pick up my mail, and I would walk up Broadway to the courthouse. And I was told not to go to the courthouse, that I was taking over for the uh, Gene Baker, who had been covering the uh, Davidson County Courthouse, and that I was going to be the new Davidson County Courthouse reporter. And they would given me no warning whatsoever. I had no earthly idea uh, how to cover the Davidson County Courthouse. I was going from two courts, a U.S. magistrate, oh, well, he was actually, a, well, no, by that time we had a U.S. magistrate. We had a commissioner before that. A.B. Neal had been the commissioner, and then Paul Jennings had become the U.S. magistrate. And we had a bankruptcy court, and Jennings, during the same, the same time period, well, that's not true. Uh, Jennings would ultimately become a bankruptcy judge. But... We didn't have very many judges, is what I'm saying. And you could keep up with the docket on the back of a matchbook. And, and all of a sudden, I had 26 courts. And the chancery courts, where the business was done, had to be covered. The criminal courts had to be covered. And then you had the occasional circuit court, traffic accident, crazy case, you know, snakes in the plane type of thing that you, you had to go cover. We had the juvenile court uh, that was off off campus, uh, out on First Avenue or First Street or First whatever it was across the river. No, it wasn't across the river. So it's First Avenue, uh, the old Howard School building. Correct. And uh, and it, so it it was a completely different game. 
Just you covering all the courts. That's right. Just John C. McLemore. And I was up against two Harvard guys. From? From Harvard. One was Kenneth Jost, who would later go on to become the first Georgetown Knight Law student to edit the Law Review at Georgetown. And he would, he would write for the Congressional Quarterly. He was, became their U.S. Supreme Court reporter for the, for the Congressional Quarterly. And so, I mean, he was, he was good. He was really good. He really tested my, my ability. My little, little BMI English major. And then there was another guy that came around the courthouse pretty regularly, and that was Al Gore Jr. Uh, that was the senator's son at that time. He wasn't even a congressman. He was just a reporter, but he was funny and a wonderful person. Uh, by the way, there was, there was also a, an, an interloper who came and thought nothing of walking into the press rooms of the Davidson County Courthouse. And she, and who in the world wants a girl reporter in a, in a, court, in a courthouse press room, which was not unlike the scenes from front page. I mean, it, it was that goofy. You had the, the guys who were covering the council and the mayor and all those guys, and then you had the court reporters. We thought we were, we were the big cheese. We really had the big news. Uh, and they were all mixed up together. And in walks Oprah Winfrey, right in the middle of all that. And she was known to the press corps as Oprah. And she was absolutely Teflon coated. I never saw her blink an eye at anything anybody said to her. She was, she was just incredible. And I remember specifically her walking into the banner press room one afternoon and saying, fellas, fellas, fellas. And we all said in unison, opera, opera, opera. She said, what's happening in this courthouse? And somebody said, you remember the lady that chopped her husband up about, uh, about Thanksgiving last year? I said, yeah, that guy deserved to get it. He, would, he was mean. I said, well, she got 55 years in the state prison today. <laughs> and she looked down at me and she said, Write me 30 seconds for the evening news on that. And I, and I wrote a little blurb for her to read. I don't know whether it was 30 seconds or not. I had no the idea how long it took to read copy. But at any rate, she took my copy and went out and read it word for word for her cameraman. And I went home. It wasn't the first time that had happened. It wasn't the last time it would happen. And I went home that night and I told my wife, I wrote Oprah's copy, copy today. You watch it. She's about to come up. I wrote that. And my wife said, there are a bunch of goofy girls over there in that, at Channel 5, and I would believe that you wrote the copy for any one of them, but I don't believe you wrote for, for Oprah. No, she does her own stuff. I never have been able to convince Carolyn that I wrote an occasional article for Oprah, but Oprah did a whole lot better than I did, so I guess it's all right. You mentioned that there was the Banner press room. How big was it? It was nice. Uh, I mean, it was filthy dirty, but it was nice. It was, it's now part of the circuit court clerk's office, and it was on, it was on the fifth floor, and uh, it was probably 20 by 20, and it had its own bathroom. And was the Tennessean press room up there too? Yes. Wayne Whit uh, hung out on, I think they were on the sixth floor. I don't think we were on the same floor. And uh, Ken Jost always covered, covered the trials and went back to the Tennessee and City Room to write. But Wayne Whit covered politics, and he was in the press room all the time. As you're working at the 
banner and covering the course both federal and then later the, the circuits, um, the Davidson County courts, were you doing anything else? Oh yeah, I was going to law school. Oh, <laughs> I think I should ask you about going to law school. What caused you to go to law school and there when did a, you start? There was a lawyer, Morris Levine, and Morris Levine would get appointments from the U.S. District Court to represent indigent defendants. And he, Morris Levine could find business just about anywhere. He was, he was a wonderful guy, he always carried trinkets and candy in his pockets, something that he had picked up from when he was an enlisted man, a sergeant, something like that, in India, where he could buy these types of things very inexpensively. During, he was part of the China Burma India theater in World War II, and he he would give things to children. He always was doing that, and so when he came around the press, he treated us like children and gave us candy. Uh, at any rate, he was in the U.S. District Court one day, and he opened the door to the to the Banner Press Room, and he looked in and says, "Are you the boy who's been writing this stuff about?" what's going on in a certain trial, something like that. And I said, yeah. He says, you're pretty good at it. I said, well, thank you. And he said, you ought to go to law school. And I said, I, I, I want to be a writer. And I really did. I wanted to be a writer. Uh, I had probably no ability, but nonetheless, that was my dream. And he said, look, you can go to the YMCA night law school. And you might get to be a lawyer, and anyway, wouldn't that help you be a better reporter? And I said, you know, it might. He said, well, just come down to the law school, and it, he knew what night they were going to start. And he said, if you, you know, talk, talk to somebody, sign up, whatever, and uh, you, you, might, you might someday be a lawyer. And I did exactly that. Now, my father, Twilight Zone experience here. My father had gone to the YMCA night law school. He had graduated from the 11th grade in Statesboro High School in Statesboro, Georgia. He had no other education, but for some reason or the other, he had gone to law school. And I don't think he ever passed the bar. I don't even know if he took the bar. But his, his life was excavation contracting, and he was good at it. Uh, but my father had gone to the Wildlife Night Law School, so that was a little motivation there. And he had been in the same class with Albert Gore Sr. And that, that had no impact on me at all other than, isn't that unusual? That we both, that my father knew Albert Gore Sr. not because of work, but because of something else that he was doing. And then I knew Al Gore Jr. because of work. Um, and. Uh, now so you, went. you went to the Nashville YMCA Night Law School. That's right, and it was in the Nashville YMCA, which was where the Sheraton Hotel is today, at the corner of 6th and, or Capitol Boulevard. Maybe it's 6th is on one side of it, Capitol Boulevard is on the other side. Correct. And uh, Union Street, maybe? That, I believe they ultimately right. moved over on Church Street. Yes, they did, to... to the corner of Church and Macklemore, which is now YMCA Way, and I have the Macklemore street sign in my office. Was that any relation? Uh, distantly, yes. All right, but you start the Nashville School of Law. Who was the dean? J.G. Lackey. And did you have to do anything special to get admitted to law school? Uh, pay them $55, I believe. Um, that was my first month's tuition. Did you have any experiences in law school that were memorable? Yes, I did. Uh, on the humorous side, we were right across from the YWCA, and between classes, there were two classes each night, uh, and we went on Mondays and Thursdays, I think, and, <laughs> and between classes, some of my fellow classmates would go over to the YWCA and see if they could maybe get a date with one of the girls that was staying. Uh, 
it was resident at the YWCA, and I went over with them a couple of times, and there was one guy that would try to convince them that they were, they were at night surgery school, and <laughs> that he had to get back because he had to operate on his cadaver. <laughs> but, but it was all in good fun. So that, that's one thing. But the thing that really touched me and changed my life was Bert Haywood. And Bert Haywood was, he taught what we call today Article 9. Uh, I wasn't aware of it, but the Uniform Commercial Code had just been rewritten and readopted or whatever, I'm, uh, and everybody was learning it. And so we were, Bert was teaching it. Maybe he had taught a couple of, of years of it, but he was right at the beginning of it. And he was, he was counsel for national life and one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And he mesmerized me with secured transactions. I know that sounds crazy, but he brought men in who were, were actually doing the financing of Rivergate Mall uh, and other big projects around Nashville and he would get these guys in and he would quiz them and, he, and he, they would talk about anchor tenants and and how how you were able to put together a finance deal that would allow the mall to pay enough to to exist and still have a profit and it was not the way that I'm sure Article 9 is normally taught, but he had ways of bringing things in and say, now, escalator. Who finances the escalator? And one of these guys would say, uh, uh, well, Otis, Otis Acceptance Corporation finances the escalator. And he says, well, do you have to file a UCC-1? And he says, oh, you better believe it. Remember, an escalator is a uh, fixture. And he says, now, what if Rivergate Mall goes under? How does Otis get its money out? How do you foreclose on an escalator that's a fixture in a building? And this guy would explain. He, he, that night, he just made it so perfectly clear that you go to the negotiation table and you sit down with the, with the lender who is financing the big building that that escalator is in, and you say, when the hammer falls on the foreclosure sale, I get such and such percent to cover my escalator. You know, and he says, he says that's the art of secured transactions. And he, Haywood just brought it to, I knew that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I knew by the, by the time I got to Haywood's class, which is two or three years in, that I was not going to do criminal law. I had seen, I had seen the disgusting underbelly of the criminal world in the criminal courts of Davidson County. I wanted no part of it at all. Uh, it was but horrible. You, somewhere from the time that you signed up for law school, by the time you got to Bert Haywood's class, you were thinking of practicing law as opposed to being a journalist and using these skills in covering the courts. What happened? Money. I, there was, I didn't want to leave Nashville. And the only, way, the only way to increase, significantly increase your salary was to go national, just to get, to get into television, something like that, and you were going to have to move. And I didn't want to move from Nashville. And I, I just began to gravitate toward practicing law. And it was a slow process, but... Then secure transactions became your bellwether. Yes, and of course, where do you, where's the door to secure transactions? Is bankruptcy court. That's when secure transactions go go bad. Chances are that happens. It happens in the bankruptcy court. Not that it doesn't happen in the chancery court occasionally, but it happens a lot in the bankruptcy court. Mm -hmm. So, you are getting ready to finish law school, and you're going to take the bar exam. Did you have a study group? 
uh, Mike Bennett and I went and took the Crosley course at, um, at UT in Knoxville. I got time off from the paper and they, 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 after four years, they gave me some a vacation so that I could go and take the Crosley course. And uh, it paid off, I passed the bar. And Mike also passed the bar and became a lawyer in town for yes, a while. Yes, he did. Then and became a Baptist missionary. Missionary to Venezuela. You stay in touch with him? He's dead. Oh, I did not know that. Yes, he, d he, died, he died about three or four years ago. I'm so sorry. But in the meantime, you take the bar and you pass, and yes. what happens? Well, I had to get a job. I, I'm, I'm back to, you know, groveling for a job somewhere. And word went out that Cecil Croson was leaving Associates Capital Corporation and going, I think he went, I don't know if he went direct to the Supreme Court from Associates or whether he went to Carmack Cochran's office for a few, for a year or two, but at any rate, Cecil left. They loved Cecil at Associates, and you talk about trying to fill shoes that were unfillable. Uh, I, I just wasn't, I wasn't pretty enough, I wasn't smooth enough, I wasn't happy enough, I wasn't anything as far as the ladies around Associates Capital were concerned. Uh, I was just that young guy that came in, and I had to, I had, I had to win them over. It How was, many lawyers were there at Associates? Dick Dance was head of the legal department, and David McMacken was the number two guy, and I was the number three guy, uh, and we were overseeing 150, 200 branches of, of Associates Capital Corporation and Cumberland Capital Corporation all the way down to Metairie, Louisiana. And, uh, it, was, it was a big operation. Was it a local company or was it owned somewhere by somebody else? It was owned by uh, Associates Financial Services. Uh, Associates Capital had at one time been owned by Dan Maddox and Mr. Moore. And Dan Maddox was the, was the front guy that everybody knew. And, uh, Dan Maddox had sold out to uh, to Associates Financial Services, which was part of the Gulf and Western conglomerate, and it wasn't any time before Dan Maddox had risen to the board of directors of Gulf and Western. And so we, we were still named Associates Capital Corporation and Cumberland Capital Corporation, but we're actually owned by Associates Financial Services, and we're just one big division of theirs. And what did you do? Uh, I did. I did three things. General Sessions Court, where I knew every one of the judges, because I'd covered them, foreclosures, and bankruptcy. Paul Jennings was, the, was the, uh, one of the bankruptcy judges. Ruth Cadard was another. Russell Hippie would come in. Uh, I believe that's the order that they, would, that they came. And, uh, and I went there, and Paul Jennings was was my mentor there, and he he took care of me. And from well, that's another part. I have to tell something else about being at Associates. During the three years I was at Associates, from 1975 to 1978, April of 75 to April of 78. Uh, it was a good place to learn. I was going to court a lot. Uh, Richard Dinkins represented every, every person in Nashville who couldn't pay a bill, and I represented the person to, or the company to whom they should be paying their bills. And we, we would go hammer and tongs at each other uh, before the General Sessions Court judges rule, uh, Regulation Z questions, things like that. And I got, to, I got to where, when I saw Richard Dickens walk, walk into the General Justice Court, I'd say, oh, no, it's a bad, you, you never prepared for these things. You just went over there and shot from the hip. And I have, I have great fond memories of Richard Dickens as a, as a trial lawyer. Uh, if you can call being in the General Sessions Court a couple of times a week, it's being a trial lawyer. You were gonna tell me about the three years that you were at Associates? Yes, during that time, the Patty, case came to a head 
and that was a challenge of the Tennessee, the Tennessee Constitution, which had a 10% maximum lending rate in it. And finance companies at that time were lending at uh, the, the APR, the, uh, was running, you know, 14, 15, 16%. And this, there was a guy over in East Tennessee named Patty I don't, I guess that was his last name. I never met the man. Uh, who was forcing this issue. You can't charge any more interest than 10% simple interest. And another VMI person, uh, Val Sanford was lead counsel for the lending institutions. And I got to watch that case from inside of Associates because we were a big part of it. We were charged. We I don't think we had a loan that was less than 10 percent. And uh, Val wrote a book on the history of interest rates in Tennessee so that he would have something to cite in his briefs. And I had a copy of that book uh, and I cannot find it. But it was fascinating about how interest, discount interest rates and all the different types of, of interest came to be, and it all had a lot to do with cotton trading. And it was, it was just a fascinating case, but ultimately the banks lost, and that forced a constitutional convention. And I got to watch, from, again, from the inside, when big business decides we've got to get in the political thicket uh, and they start, every, every secretary, every branch manager, everybody we had was at the polling places with signs, you know, vote for, uh, vote in favor of the Constitution, Constitutional Convention, vote in favor of the Constitution, uh, the changes, the recommendations, all these things. Um, and I had actually run for the office of county ranger at the insistence of the banner when I was a newspaper reporter there uh, to write fun, funny stories about the politics of the county court which still existed in Nashville. And uh, the county ranger was done, done away with in, uh, by the Constitutional Convention. And it was sad, it, it, I, I never got to be the county ranger that's a person that goes around and rounds up loose livestock and holds it until uh, until the owner can be found, and then gets to charge the owner for your you know for <laughs> for keeping their cows or sheep or whatever for however long you kept them. I had no facility to carry out the duties, but I ran a tough race, lost. And as a consequence of um, working at associates and observing what happens when big business gets its ox gored in a sense uh, what did you do you were the third lawyer you're there for two or three years yeah I was there for three years and the patty decision shut down lending so all of a sudden the entire associates and Cumberland Council Cumberland Capital uh, imploded. It, yeah, they they were collecting money. Money was coming in hand over fist because people were paying their obligations to the company, but they couldn't loan any money. And it was with that that the big office in on Mishawaka Avenue in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, no South Bend, Indiana, uh, decided that there were going to be some big changes and. They consolidated a lot of stuff, and and I was not even offered a job. Uh, Dick Dance and David McMacken were offered jobs at the legal department in Dallas, Texas. That they they moved they moved the home office from uh, South Bend, Indiana, to Dallas, and uh, I I wasn't even invited. N neither Dick Dance nor David McMacken had any any intention of moving out of Nashville. And so David and I went into practice, Mac Mackin and Macklemore. And we 
um, rented some space in one commerce place uh, on the same floor with Waller, Lanson, Dorch, and Davis, uh, which we could hear uh, their receptionist was a wonderful person, and you could hear her all over the floor, the, the elevator, lobby, everything. You could, you could hear her over everything else, Waller, Lanson, Dorch, and Davis. <laughs> and one, one of my, one of my uh, fondest memories of being on that floor with, with Waller, Lanson, Dorch, and Davis was a confrontation between Dan Garfinkel, a criminal lawyer who wore, who wore flashy. Gold, flashy clothes, gold chains, diamond rings, uh, the world's worst comb over, and he had a huge criminal practice, and which extended into ladies of the night. And Dick Lansden, who was, he was sort of the executive officer of Waller, Lansden, and Dorch Davis, he was, the, he was the mean old man, confronted Garfinkel in the elevator lobby to tell him to tell his clients to turn to the left when they got off the elevator and not come into their reception room and not walk around on their fancy carpet and not bother the lady who said Waller, Lansden, and Dorch Davis. And I'll never forget, I just stood there and watched. And Garfinkel looked at Dick Lansden and said, Dick, just once, just, Dick, just once in your life, I wish you would get a client whose last name is not Ink. <laughs> <laughs> and, and turned around and walked away. I don't think the ladies of the night were ever given any direction as to where to go when they got off the elevator. <laughs> but well, one thing I didn't ask is when you first started working for Associates, first legal job, what was your salary? Ooh, about $10,000 a year. All right. And did it change much over the three years? I think I got a thousand dollar raise each, each year, or something. So like you that. go into private practice now. You don't have a set salary. You're going to make your own way. Yes. How did you do those first two or three years? We had some savings. My wife had been a teacher, but that was soon to come to an end uh, because we we waited for me to graduate from law school before we had a baby, and uh, the. One of the things I asked Dick Dance when, when he interviewed me was, we're going to have a baby, will the, will, the, uh, will the insurance cover the delivery of the baby? And or if not, how much will it cover? And he told me not to worry about it. That, that it and David McMacken was in the room. Well, it turns out you had to come to work, and then you, you were not eligible for the baby benefit for so many months. And it came down to like a day and a half. Will was born a day and a half into when the insurance would pay. And McMacken told Dance, he says, you're going to pay for that baby out of your own pocket. said, I remember what you told Mac. Don't worry, don't worry. But the, cover, the insurance covered. But... All right, so when you start it in, in your uh, own association with uh, David McMacken, yeah. you said you had some savings. We had some savings, and we had the associates business. We had a collection business mm -hmm. from associates. That helped, and Johnny Cobb helped. We, we started doing title work. Ah. And how did you get into the title business? Uh, You've been doing collections, foreclosures, and bankruptcy. David McMacken and I went down and took a little course from Johnny Cobb on how to search titles. And, and he, who was Johnny Cobb? He owned attorney's title. And young lawyers could go in and learn how to search title and search titles for him. And, he, and associates had so many real estate loans that uh, we just did associates work. 
Now, it's been a long time since. Now, now there's one other thing. Just as soon, just as soon as I started uh, practicing in private practice, uh, I got appointments as trustee in bankruptcy. And that's just about the time that the bankruptcy law changed. It is. That's that's very astute. That's right. The bankruptcy law was written. Uh, the Chandler Act had been in effect for 80 or 90 years, and uh, bankruptcy code was completely rewritten in 19 and was adopted in 1979. Went into effect in 1979, and that was the beginning of the Mid South Commercial Law Institute. Uh, somebody had to teach the law to the lawyers. It was it was a complete new law, and it had to be taught. And a group of lawyers got together. Um, uh, Dick Dance and others put together. Tommy Canada, um, the the attorney. The attorney Jim Roberts from Third National Bank, uh, and a, a John Bailey, uh, just a, a lot of, of really fine lawyers, put together the Mid South Commercial Law Institute, and they their first program was to teach the new law, uh, right when it was going into effect. The Mid South Commercial Law Institute has has survived to this day and is uh, has the best commercial law seminar I think going uh, every December and I would I was not on the first board of directors but the second year I was invited to join the board of directors and stayed there for years until I became president at which time I took advantage of my office and rewrote the bylaws so that people would start rotating off the board and uh, got that I, that was my big contribution and I rotated myself off pretty quickly uh, and, but but I, I take pride in, in having been part of that. Um, it was, and, and it changed the face of the bankruptcy court in Nashville. Because, oh, so. because the, the lawyers who had been practicing bankruptcy law were old. And Paul Jennings, when he took the bench, started calling up the big law firms and asking who, if you have to come to bankruptcy court, who do you send? And he started finding people like Rick Humbrecht, John Bailey, and uh, any number of, believe it or not, Davis Carr, uh, any number of people who started taking trustee dockets, even though they're getting paid almost nothing for it, in order to change the, the face of the court. And, and it was a very effective thing that Jennings did. And I got to be part of that because I had been in the bankruptcy court all, a lot during my time at Associates. And so just as soon as I got out in private practice, they started appointing me. And that was, that was a big help. And I've been I've been a bankruptcy trustee ever since. And it was it was Jennings who called me in one day and said, "We finally learned our lesson. The bar is too small in Cookville for us to pick a trustee up there. Every time we pick a trustee in Cookville, that person becomes the bankruptcy expert." starts getting debtor cases and 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 we've got to have an outsider be the trustee who will agree if we give you every single case up there you won't take any cases as a debtor's counsel up there and so we're going to cut out this conflict of interest thing will you take the job and he said, and we will leave you on the Nashville docket, on the Nashville rotation. So that was in addition to what I was already doing, I picked up 
100% of the 11 county Upper Cumberland division of the U U.S. District Court. And that was a big help. Uh, and I had, uh, I, I was able to stay in Nashville and well, I did got, your firm expand? Oh yeah, yeah. We finally got up to about seven lawyers over over the years. Who and, did you bring in? Uh, David Mangum, who has turned out to be a, a wonderful bankruptcy lawyer. Uh, Suzanne Mossman, Elizabeth Smith. Now Suzanne Mossman is not Suzanne Mossman anymore. She's got another name, and I can't. But uh, Elizabeth Smith. Elizabeth passed away, but Punky. Punky. Uh, Punky's brothers had gone to BMI, and one of her brothers, uh, Joe Joe Smith, was at BMI when I was there, and he had placed me on report for long hair, and I told her if he ever, ever came into my office uh, on a visit to Nashville that I was going to get a ruler and measure his hair uh, and place him on report because I'm sure his hair was long by, by that time. But uh, Elizabeth was wonderful. She was. She was, one of the, she was one of the best real estate lawyers around and, uh, and really was a help to us. But she went on to better things too. Um, let's see, we, we've had Philip Young, we've had, uh, Justin Campbell, Ghulam Zaid, um, let's see, uh, Frank Abernathy practiced with us. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, Elliot Jones practiced with us for a while. Elliot Warner Jones. Elliot Warner Jones, yes. And we, we moved around town from different offices, but uh, finally, the, the 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 firm split. David McMacken was of the opinion that a, a real law firm had to be in the had to have its shingle in the downtown area, and Bobby Garfinkel and I both thought we were paying a whole lot too much for parking, and that that we didn't benefit anything by being in the downtown area. When did you bring Bobby in? Oh, that was that was part of. Dan Garfinkel being down the hall from us. Bobby, Bobby graduated from Emory and he shows up in Dan Garfinkel's office and starts going, <laughs> of course, he's practicing with, with Dan and the guy who looked like, looked like Phil Silvers. Um, well, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I can't remember. But it was a criminal practice, and Bobby didn't want that. And he would come up and talk to David, and David tell him, this is what we're doing. And, and finally, he just jumped ship and joined us while we were still in one commerce place, I think. And, and he had an LLM in tax law, didn't he? Bobby? He, he, had a, he had a master's degree in creative writing from uh, Johns Hopkins. He was a Yale, Yale undergrad. Who went to school with George. Oh, George, uh, George W. Bush, right, and was invited and went when George W. Bush had his class come to the White House for a class reunion. So Bobby joins you, and David thought that you needed to stay downtown. Yeah, we needed to stay downtown. And, and did you? Oh, no. Bobby and I both wanted to go out to um, to Green Hills, his his uncle or cousin, um, Mr. Zeitlin, uh, was owned owned the old telephone building at 2000 Richard Jones Road, and it had just been completely renovated. I mean, completely. They had when we walked in to look at space, there were no partitions inside that building. It was unbelievable. Uh, the only way, way you could tell that, that the uh, building had been used 
was you could see the tile on the floor. Uh, and some of it had come up and some of it hadn't been taken up yet. Now, what year was this that you moved to Green Hills? Ooh. Let's see, we started in 78. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it was. In the 80s? Oh, it was in the late 80s. Okay. Yeah. So oh, Ed Walker. Ed Walker practiced with us. I forgot to mention Ed Walker. My goodness. My goodness. Yeah. He was, okay. he was a piece of work. Did he come with you? Yeah. And he came. Ed, Bobby, and I came to Green Hills, and uh, it proved to be, we, we had come five years later than we should have. Uh, it turned out to be a, a very good move for us, especially after we found out that we could cut over to, to Belmont Boulevard and go in on Music Row to the bankruptcy court. And what were you doing in bankruptcy during those years? Oh. You're serving as trustee serving in Nashville as trustee. and Cookville. Yeah. Serving and, and getting getting my share of Chapter 11 cases too, but the I had I had the the first I had a a couple of interesting cases right off the bat. One was DNR Livestock in Sparta. It's a Chapter 11. I was appointed trustee of. We brokered goats, and I kept that company alive for six years until we finally got a a plan of reorganization um, and I, I would never do that again but I was just determined that I was going to get a plan done and we did finally uh, selling goats I bet you learned a lot about goats yes and I well, I'll have to admit that I took advantage of the situation later on at that time my son was in probably in elementary school but when he got to Yale and he finished his first year he uh, he wanted to know how he was supposed to get home and he didn't have a car and I told him I'd buy him an airplane ticket if he wanted and he wanted to bring a girl home with him that he had met and I said okay you want a ride home I think I can get you a ride home I called up the guy at DNR Livestock, his name was Donnie. I called Donnie on the phone. I said, do you still deliver to New Haven, deliver goats to New Haven? And he said, yeah, we do. And I said, would you pick my son up next time you go up there and bring him home? And so he and, I don't think it was fair to call her a girlfriend. She was a girl that was a friend, but they they wrapped up all of their, uh, all of their worldly belongings in big black plastic bags and duct taped them and <laughs> and home they came in the in the tractor trailer truck it was least running empty but that's the reason they had to wrap up all the boxes and stuff because the uh, the boxes went into the trailer well you and said you had several interesting cases uh, in Eddie Montgomery no. was was the trusteeship that that really put us on the map uh, I had been in elementary school with Eddie Montgomery. He, he had a residential real estate closing operation and he was running about $15 million through his escrow account every month. And as anybody who plays with money, and I use that term probably incorrectly, but if you're around a lot of money, and I have been around a lot of money in my life. And you, number one, you gotta learn to leave it alone. And number two, you can find out the power of a huge amount of money because you don't ever need it all. And if you're closing $15 million worth of home, residential home closings a month, and your escrow account is staying at $15 million balance because you're getting new customers every single day, then you can borrow some of that money and never be found out until the market crashes. And Eddie kept dipping in and dipping in and dipping in, and he finally got behind about $7 million and began, in doing that, he started kiting checks between Commerce Union Bank, Third National Bank, and Metropolitan Federal. I believe Commerce Union Bank by that time was Sovereign Bank, but it was the same buildings. 
uh, and he, this kiting operation was the way that he kept going. And it was, it was a real, real eye-opening case for me because we, we found out how he was doing what he was doing. And people would say, you have had to reconstruct the books of Eddie Montgomery's office, we understand. And we would say, no, we had to construct the books. He was looking, he, this was the early days of computers, and Eddie was looking at his balances in his various accounts each morning, and may, he was quite bright, and making calculations of how much money he could spend that day. And he, we had a deposition in which his chief bookkeeper had explained that they did not maintain any ledgers at all. They simply had a drawer full of checks, and Mr. Montgomery told them every morning how much they could spend. And uh, it, it, was, it was a big deal. The, the reason it put us on the map was the kiting operation. We, we believed and were able to prove that it caused preferential transfers. Keith London had the case, uh, and he called them unauthorized loans. The kites were unauthorized loans, and we ended up equalizing the money between Metropolitan Federal, Sovereign, and uh, Third National, and because Third National had, sh had shut down the kite first, and cashed all checks that were on hand, refused all checks that came in for payment. It picked up a $3 million advantage, and we won that all the way to the Sixth Circuit, and Third National had to write us a check for $3 million. That was a big day. Um, big case. Big case, a case that, that had ramifications across the nation. Nobody had ever had ever thought about a kite being a preferential transfer, and um, they did after that. So. And what happened to Eddie? He went to prison. Um, that <laughs> one of the things that people don't understand is that over the course of my career, I've probably put eight or ten people in prison. One of whom was a fellow trustee. I got a call from the court one day, not long after I started being a trustee, and was maybe two or three years, and was told that there was a case that I needed to take over from a fellow trustee. And who was that? I can't remember his. I really can't. Okay. I really cannot remember his name. That's right. And I don't know that I would tell you if. if it's uh, all public record. <laughs> yes, it is, but. He's gone on to other things. Okay. He went to prison. Uh, but I took that case and, and just sat down and did the math and traced out where the money had gone and it had gone straight into his personal bank account. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was the first person I sent to prison. But I've had, a, I've had a bunch since then. All right. Now, you've mentioned two memorable cases that you've had as trustee while you're with Bobby and... Um, well, I've had, I've had Ed. a lot with Bobby and Ed. Um, the um, are you still with them? No, I'm the last man standing. Bobby retired about a couple of years ago. Ed retired before Bobby and moved to Chicago. Oh. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to stay on till, uh, till 2024. And the reason is. We go back to Morris Levine. Uh, Morris Levine re represented poor people, and he was just a good guy. And on the night that he was awarded his 50-year award for for um, service at the, at the bar at the banquet, he told me he said. 
I want you to know this. I came from the office. I didn't fly up here from Boca Raton. I practiced today. And I said to myself, I want to do that. You want to practice until you get that 50-year badge. That's right. I want, and it happens in December of 2024. All right. Now, you still have an active practice. Yes. You're still a trustee. Yes. Still doing Chapter 11s. Still doing Chapter 11s and still, and, and of course, my practice has expanded into receiverships, something that you have uh, experience with. You've yes. appointed me. I have. Uh, and I've, I've got probably the biggest case that I've ever had in my life right now, and that's babysitting, for lack of a better word. That's a legal term, I think. Uh, a, an enormous, well, I am watching over Nashville's second largest tourist attraction. It throws off huge amount of money. And uh, while the owner and his wife, the, the uh, the divorce started four years ago, and they're still not divorced. Um, and I'm, I'm overseeing, I pay all the bills for Marathon Village. Marathon Village? Yes. Oh. Yeah. And I, I sign the checks when the, when the painter comes and paints. I sign the checks when, when the electricity bill has to be paid, whatever. Uh, How long have you been doing that? Since <laughs> I've been doing that for about six months now. And, uh, and you, have to watch, you have to watch the whole, that's, you have to watch everybody like a hawk. And uh, it's, but it's what I do for a living. And there's ever so much more to tell you about. We somehow skipped over the fact that I covered Tom Shriver's uh, district attorney's office for three and a half or four years. And I, I'm just while I was you just, were a reporter, while I was a reporter there, yes. You know, the, the names that come that flash back to me in those days: Rick McCulley, Ed Yarborough, Tommy Thompson, Aaron Wyckoff, Doug Thorson, Bo Edwards, Bobby Schwartz were were the primary prosecutors in that office. What a show that was to to be in court with those guys every day. And all of this with Raymond Leathers, Alan Cornelius, and John Draper as the criminal court judges. Okay. <laughs>